Welcome to the This Is Horror Podcast. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson, and today we are going to be reconvening with S.P. Moskowski for the third and final part of our interview. In this conversation, we talk to S.P. about her novel, I Wish I Was Like You, We talk about writing advice, including widely given writing advice that SP disagrees with. We talk about the books that SP would include in a weird fiction syllabus. We talk about living in the Pacific Northwest and much, much more. So before we get into that, let's have a quick word from our sponsors. Edited by Daniel Kayaku with an introduction by Jonathan Mayberry. California Screaming peels back to sunshine and palm trees to expose the hidden darkness in the brutal heart of the Golden State. Forget sun-drenched beaches and shocker-given surfers. Think eldritch river monsters and haunted ghost towns. California Screaming takes readers on a hellish road trip down the 101. From windblown deserts to the foothills of San Gabriel Mountains, E.S. McGill, Kevin Wetmore, Chad Stroop, Sarah Reed, Kevin David Anderson, and many more spin tales of terror that will make you rethink your next vacation. California Screaming is available in paperback and ebook October 22nd. So wax up your board and get ready to scream with 14 of the West Coast's finest authors. Coming October 5th, Deciduous Tales is a new literary journal featuring the very best in dark fiction. Join Richard Thomas, Matthew Brockmeyer, Douglas Milliken, Brian Asman, Josh Chaplinski, and more on a journey through the shadowy realms of literature. From horror and suspense to neo noir and transgressive, from classic creators to contemporary authors, Deciduous Tales is dedicated to highlighting the thought provoking, the scintillating, and the strange. Find out more at DeciduousTales.com or visit our Facebook page, Deciduous Tales, available October 5th. Get yours today. All right, and with that said, here is the third and final part of our conversation with S.P. Miskowski. And now for a horror interview. So I'd like to talk a little bit about I Wish I Was Like You. Firstly, just as a way of an introduction, what would you like to tell our listeners about it and why should they go out and buy a copy. I Wish I Was Like You is a ghost story. You know, I, I said that I like um, Japanese horror films. Mm. And and um, by that I mean, I, for a while I was really obsessed with, and there were a lot of stories of vengeful spirits, um, vengeful ghosts, and I, I find that idea very, very compelling. Um, a lot of the stories I write, and, um, and I think to a certain extent, all of the books have to do with um, spite and envy and revenge um, with, with dissatisfied individuals trying to get even or trying to get a little bit more or trying to get what they think they really want. It's always been very fascinating to me. I don't know about you guys, but I've only been really betrayed by someone um, a few times. And it really just, you know, someone like, like what you were describing, Bob, you know, the, the, Hey, I'm so successful and, you know, I'm into football and I, you know, do everything right. And, uh, and then, you know, and then somebody like that just comes along and just stabs you in the back. (laughs) Like, for something for something that you don't even consider to be truly significant, right? But I, I know I know what you're talking about. And you... It's inexplicable. It doesn't make any sense to me when somebody does that because I I mean, you know, I've been disappointed too, and I've had bad thoughts about someone before, and I've wished that, you know, someone didn't have very, very good luck. But to actually set out to harm another person is a is a really crazy thing. And I right. I just don't I don't understand it. So whenever that's happened or whenever I've seen somebody do that to someone else, it's always struck me as um, I, I was very interested in it because I don't really get it. I don't really understand it. So I'm always delving into I'm always trying to figure out what are the circumstances and who is this person? What is their mindset? What is this individual? And so the, 
the character in I Wish I Was Like You is a writer who doesn't who doesn't have any of the encouragement that I've gotten from people who um, because, you know, even when I was living in Seattle in the early 90s, I mean, I I had uh, an an NEA fellowship for short stories and and then I got another one for playwriting. And um, I've always from the beginning when I started writing stories and really working on them seriously and mailing them out. I got them published in literary magazines and um, and then, you know, later on I worked in theater and, and then I went back to writing fiction. But and, and then again, you know, people were interested and they were supportive of me and they were interested in what I was doing. But I know what it's like to be frustrated and to work hard and to have something not turn out the way you want it to. But I didn't give up. And I I wanted to create this character who no matter how hard she tried, she couldn't get recognition. It's kind of like she was a ghost in her real life before she died. And, um, and she, she went to the city. She went to Seattle in the early nineties, like I did. Um, but her experience of it was, was pure failure. Okay. Okay. I know what it's like to be in, to live in Seattle in the early '90s and to be broke, to be absolutely broke, and to actually to get to a point where you're, you know, you've sold whatever little pieces of jewelry you have to be melted down, and you've and you've sold as many books as you can bear to sell to buy food, and and to just look over at someone and think, you know. I'll bet she has a lot of money in that purse. I wonder if I could follow her and get that purse, <laughs> you know? And it is not a thing that I would do, but it's something that I thought about because I was really desperate. So I was trying to capture that desperation, not only being poor and and not having a college degree and not having a, a job skill that would bring in enough money for you to, make the rent and eat well, but also being sort of sort of lost as someone who wants to write stories, someone who wants to be creative. Um, no matter what she does, she keeps failing. And this is right on the heels of having moved to Seattle just sort of to spite this crime fiction writing teacher that she had, that she had an affair with. Um, she had a relationship with him and and he tried to help her and give her good advice, and she rejected all of his good advice. So throughout the novel, you hear the voice of this writing teacher, and he says, these are the rules of fiction, of crime fiction writing. These are the rules, and this is what you should never do. Like, never open your story with a corpse. Yeah. It's a cliche. Don't do it. If you do it, I'll throw your manuscript in your face. Yeah, I I love I love the next section. <laughs> <laughs> the first paragraph of the novel introduces a corpse, yeah. and um, so this I wanted to find out what what not what a vengeful spirit does, but what is what is the making of this particular vengeful spirit? What is how does this woman's life translate into just spending all of her time in what is sort of a void in the afterlife, this, this kind of lost territory, which unfortunately is exactly like the city that she lived in. It's, it's the same place. She's trapped there. She just can't go anywhere else. And everything that she does I wanted it to make sense in light of her failure, but I also wanted it to make it clear that she was responsible for some of her personal failure. She might not have been able to do more to make herself successful as a writer, but she could have been more successful in her relationships. And so I was really kind of looking at what this very angry person, how she turned into this 
spirit that haunts the streets of Seattle and looks for people who, um, the, you know, to, to do spiteful, horrible things to them or to make suggestions to them, to make them do s- horrible things to themselves. Um, and it, it just became this sort of existential ghost story with this person who didn't want to live in this place in, to begin with. She only went there because she was angry at somebody, and now she's angry because she's dead. <laughs> and now she's and she's angry because she was never successful. And she's angry because all around her are these people who are trying to accomplish something, and she just sets out to harm as many people as possible. But again, it goes back to that idea of spite. We were we were talking about the idea of spite. Um, Envy is looking at somebody else and saying, mm, I wish I had that, or I wish I were you, or, you know, I wish I, I wish I was like you, um, you know, and the title is, is a reference to, um, the Nirvana song, um, all apologies. And that sense is something we can all recognize, but the next step is spite. It's spiteful to act on that you know, to carry out uh, an action against another individual. And that's where, you know, some of us draw the line and, and some people don't draw the line. So I wanted to look at and, and have fun with, you know, I mean, it's dark. It's very, very dark. But I think it's also funny that she keeps crossing that line. Do you know, she's someone who she decides, well, okay, fine, screw it. If I'm not going to be successful at any of these things, I'm going to try and, you know, harm other people. That step is something that I've never really understood, but I wanted to explore it and see, and see if I could create a character who plausibly could be entirely spiteful, just made of spite. Yeah. It's definitely an interesting character dynamic. And the inclusion of the creative writing tutor, Lee Todd Butcher, <laughs> means that you actually get quite a bit of writing advice and author recommendations for those <laughs> looking at writing crime fiction in particular. Now, <laughs> I wondered how much of Butcher's advice do you agree and disagree with? <laughs> Well, I think he's I think he's talking about more <clears throat> formulaic fiction than I am really interested in. Um, I'm kind of interested in books that 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 sort of break the rules. Yeah. Um, you know, the pledge, my Durian Mott. I I that's just a wonderful book um, because it it breaks the rules. Um, you think something's going to be resolved, and and really the 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 story um, doesn't have a satisfying conclusion, and that's the point of the story. Um, the pledge doesn't really end; it never really ends because there can't be resolution because uh, this vicious crime, these vicious crimes, are committed. And it doesn't turn out like a nice detective novel where, you know, or, you know, crime fiction on TV where somebody gets arrested and has to pay the price. Um, it's, it's more about what are we doing here? What are we doing here in this void? And what do we do with the crimes that, that are never paid for? What do we do with, you know, the, the, the tragedy of a crime that is never there's never any resolution or redemption. Um, those are the kind of stories that that I am more interested in. Um, I I like short stories by Ruth Rendell. Um, I never really was crazy about her novels because they were sort of like that. You know that they, they were sort of detective novels where things sort of the universe kind of made sense, right? But in her short stories and her novellas, she has these really scary, inexplicable things that happen out of 
out of someone's personality, out of their inability to make themselves behave in a certain way, their inability to get a grip on their obsession. Um, and that's the kind of thing that interests me. So I would say that his advice is good, um, but it's for the kind of novel where you know where you are. You, you know who the detective is, you know who the characters are, and you know what's going on. And I wish I was like you, which is uh, the central character's life story is the antithesis of that. Um, the, there is no formula. <laughs> and so every single time of, you know, a, a bit of advice is introduced, it's immediate, immediately or almost immediately contradicted. <laughs> One of my favorite parts of, of the story, because you see the advice and you think, okay, I can't wait to see how you're now going to break that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but there's one where, where uh, he says, you know, don't ever, don't ever take a change of direction, make a change of direction to, in your story um, by having a character walk through the door and introduce, you know, some new information or just, you know, and just walk through the door and do it for you. And that's exactly what happens in the next scene. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of advice. There's so much writing advice. And you can find it online. You can find it in, in writing manuals. People are constantly offering it <laughs> on Facebook. Right. And some of it's quite good. I mean, you can get good writing tips from people who write all the time and whose writing is the kind of work that you aspire to do. If it's, if it's something kind of connected to what you're trying to do, but all too often, um, new writers will just take a set of rules and try to stick to them religiously and wreck their own story or wreck their own work because what they're, what their story is about or what they're trying to do doesn't really fit those rules. So, you know, writing advice, it's, it, I think, I think uh, we've talked about this before, you know, when we, I think that was my main advice to people when you were collecting tips, Michael, mm. um, uh, writing tips for that one episode. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that that's what I said. I said, take everything with a grain of salt, try it out. And if it doesn't work for you, throw it away. Um, it, it may or may not work for your story. It's good to know rules. It's good to know formulas. It's good to know um, what works for somebody else, but it may or may not work for you. Um, and, and in the case of the character in the novel, she never does find out what works for her. She doesn't have a chance to because she's just fumbling around by herself. Yeah. She never takes anybody's advice. She never lets anyone really, there's only one character that she really allows to sort of love her and take care of her. And even then she takes advantage of him because she doesn't know, she's never had that and she doesn't know how to do anything else. Was there any widely given story advice that you strongly disagree with? Um, I strongly disagree with the notion that characters, that your central character needs to be likable um, or relatable. I think some of the most interesting characters in literature and, and certainly in the books that I like to read are not at all likable. They have to be interesting. Yeah. They have to be engaging. What they're doing has to be of some interest to you. You don't have to hope that things turn out well for them. You don't even have to do that. There's a Zoe Heller book called um, What Was She Thinking, uh, which is also the, the alternate title is Notes on a Scandal. And it was adapted into a, a Kate Blanchett, Judy Dench film. And I didn't... <sighs> The performances were very good, but I didn't like the film because I thought they oversimplified the relationship. The relationship really is one woman trying to absorb another woman. Um, it, 
is from it is this point of view of this character is so unattractive. She's so unattractive. And when you translate that to film and you're as an audience, you're looking at her and she's unattractive and she's physically unattractive. And you see how manipulative she is right from the get go. It's just not as effective, no matter how good the performances are. And it's kind of wrapped up in there and they kind of slapped a happy face on the ending, that which I really, really didn't like. But um, this woman is, is wrecking another woman's life. She wants, it's not just a matter of her wanting to have a relationship with this other woman. She wants to be her, she wants to destroy her, and she wants to absorb her. And, and all at the same time, she wants to consume this person and by consuming her, become her and then destroy, you know, her as a separate entity, right? That's what's really driving her. And it's fascinating. It's fascinating. But she's a horrible person. So it really has to do with how captivating you it's a challenge as a writer and you may or may not succeed and I may or may not succeed but it's very exciting and very interesting to attempt to make a story captivating enough and engrossing enough that you want to find out what happens next even though you don't you don't find the character likable at all and you don't uh you don't identify with her yeah. So I'm not a fan of the likable or relatable character. There are some that are great. There are some wonderful, likable, interesting characters out there. Um, but I, I don't, I'm not drawn to those books, you know. I'm drawn to books, even when I read something that's successful, that's, um, you know, that's done very, very well, it's going to be something, you know, it's going to be something like The Wicked Girls um, by Alex Marwood or, um, you know, uh, Behind Her Eyes by Sarah Pinborough or, or, you know, something like that. Mm. Or The Ghost Rider by John Harwood. I mean, these, you know, where people are doing things and you can see that they're doing things for the wrong reasons. And what they're trying to do is affecting other people in a negative way. But it's very compelling. You can't stop reading it. Um, so that's kind of that's what I'm drawn to as a reader, and and it's what I what I like to attempt as a writer. I don't know if I get there, but but I attempt that because I think that I just think it's more interesting. I just think it the the dynamic between an unlikable or difficult or complicated or spiteful character um, and the people around them, it, it's more interesting and, and a bit suspenseful because you you actually become a little afraid for the other characters. Yeah. <laughs> you wonder you wonder what's going to happen to them when they get involved with this person. Yeah. Well someone who's too likable is probably boring and we said a similar thing with a conversation with Nadia Bolkin, you just, mm -hmm. you don't, you don't want to read about someone who's too perfect or too good. Mm -hmm. You want to have some flaws. And I, yeah. and I think if you yeah. take the television series Lost, one of the most interesting characters was Sawyer. And yeah. you know, yeah. it's, it's looking, looking at the psychology, what made that person who they are, what has made them make these morally questionable choices mm -hmm. and really mm -hmm. tapping into that and that's what makes for an exciting story whether it's told on the page or on the screen yeah 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 and i think and the, and i think the writers whose work i'm drawn to um they're not much concerned with the likability or the or the popularity or the uh heroism of their characters. Um, Aikman certainly didn't seem to be interested in that. I don't think that's a concern for Laird Barron. Um, you know, 
John Langan doesn't try to write you know, in heroic characters who are going to redeem themselves or redeem everyone else by the end. Mm. Um, I just think it's more interesting because you can't get through life without being damaged. So if you look at a character, you have to ask yourself, is this a damaged person? Damaged in what way? What have they, what have they been through? And then, you know, of course, the, the form of the story, the form of the novel, uh, the shape of it, the structure of it is, is the part to me that's the most fun. Um, but shaping a story that will contain and make sense out of a character who is deeply flawed is of the most interest to me. Yeah, definitely. So I feel like I, I think, I hope I've justified um, this character, Greta, in I Wish I Was Like You. I, I hope that I have justified her in the sense that you get where she's coming from and why she's doing what she's doing. But what she's doing is awful. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll certainly be recommending the book to everyone who would like a book recommendation. And that, that's probably the place I'd advise people to start with your work. I mean, why, why not start with the latest one? I mean, unless they have a particular affinity for short stories, then, of course, pick up the collection. Pick, mm -hmm. pick up both. Thank you. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> I hope the, the, the short story collection, Strange as the Night, is coming out um, this week, um, um, October 13th, Friday the 13th. Ah. So... Uh, we will see. So keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> fingers crossed, you guys. <laughs> that people pick it up and read it and find it interesting. Yeah. I think they will. Yes. So do I. Thank you. I hope so. Well, we've got a number of questions from our Patreon. So oh, my God. Let's start with a question from Box Wino. So he says... If you were to host a class studying the field of horror and the weird, what would be on your syllabus? This can be stories, novels, movies, and even non-fiction. The film, the Japanese film Juan. So good. The, the Ring, uh, the original one. And I would go back to the HDTV version of Juan because of the way it's edited. The Japanese theatrical version is slightly different, and the um, the English language version follows the Japanese theatrical version pretty much. But the editing for the original HDTV um, Juan was really disturbing, and I would I would have that in there. Um, I would include um, Japanese tales of mystery and imagination. Um, uh, I would include Alone with the Horrors uh, as a, you know, just a, a good selection of uh, Ramsey Campbell. Um, I would include uh, Laird Barron, um, at least his, his uh, short story collections. Um, he's terrific. I would include... Well, definitely those, definitely those. And probably a couple of the mammoth book of best new horror. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a couple of the uh, best uh, horror, um, the annual best horror editions, volumes edited by Ellen Datlow. Because I think that Stephen Jones and Ellen Datlow are... Uh, they have impeccable taste, and you kind of can't go wrong. Um, any of those anthologies that they have edited, where they if if they call it the best, it's some. It, it may not be the absolute best of the year, but it's damn good, and it's and it's among the best. Um, 
you know, maybe they couldn't fit all of the best into the, the volume that year. Right. But it's really, really top notch writing. And, um, you know, you should, you should be reading stories by people like Alison Littlewood and, um, uh, Gary McMahon and, um, you know, these writers that you might not find them on your own, just kind of stumbling around. But if you read these anthologies, you will find them and then you can move on to their other works. Yeah. Oh, you definitely should. So I'd use, I, that, those would be my starting points. Yeah. And with Gary McMahon, I mean, his Concrete Grove trilogy is fantastic. And I know within the scene in the UK, it got quite a bit of buzz, but generally I think it should have had more readers than it has. So seek it out. I'm, I'm, I'm always amazed uh, that somebody hasn't snapped him up and made films out of all of his work. And, you know, he's doing well and he has such a great reputation and writers know his work and, and he has an audience and he has a following. You know, he, he does. His, his work is well known. But, um, but I always expect, you know, I, I just keep, to, keep expecting it to be, to like, to have some huge breakthrough any day and become even bigger than that um, in terms of popularity. Um, but there are so many great writers uh, that I would recommend, but you can find a sample of their work in these books, yeah. in these anthologies. And then you sort of have the basis for, you get to know them a little bit and you find out which ones are most interesting to you. So should definitely check out the latest Stephen Jones um, and Ellen Datlow anthologies. Yeah. This is the beauty of anthologies. Generally, I remember discovering a number of writers via Solaris's The End of the Line, which Jonathan Oliver had edited. Oh, yeah. That's a cracking anthology, but... yeah. I mean, there's even, I, I have a feeling that there might be a collaborative effort from Sarah Pinbra and Paul Malloy. And mm. both of those writers are well worth checking out. Paul Malloy, yeah. is, he's a fantastic short story writer, but I know you don't see that much by him. But when you do, <laughs> it's an event. It's well worth getting into. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sarah Pinborough's latest book, um, Behind Her Eyes, uh, you know, the, people talk about page turners and uh, say, I couldn't put this book down. Well, I couldn't put that book down. I, I, I started reading it while we were, um, as soon as we arrived up here in Canada. And, and uh, it really, it got me through the first few days of settling in and sort of getting used to a whole new place. Because it, I was riveted. I was just fascinated, and and it's gutsy. I mean, she does something. She does a little turnaround, a twist in there, and then another twist. The second twist is is just brilliant. The first twist, if if I, I could see how it was going to divide readers, right? Like there were going to be people who would get to that point and say what? No. And wouldn't buy it. They wouldn't buy what she was introducing. Okay. At that point in the story, because up to that point, it was all a kind of psychological suspense. But if you get what she's saying and you buy into it, you know, you accept it based on everything you've read up to that point. If you accept it, it's just really, it's so fun and exciting. And um, the people who do, the people who like the book far outnumber the people who jumped off the boat at that point. And um, the people who like it are passionate about it and yeah. recommend it to all of their friends, but, you know, swear them to secrecy, not to reveal the ending. So that's one of those, that's one of those books where you just go, damn, damn, that was a good idea. Yeah. And look, she executed it perfectly. And you can never please everyone anyway, and I don't think really no. you'd want to. I mean, having 
a divisive book or a divisive plot point is a sign that you're doing something right. I mean, no yeah. one no one wants a lukewarm reception. You don't want everyone to think, yeah, that was okay. That right. ticked some of the boxes that I would like in a story. You don't want that yeah. at all. So if some people yeah. love it and some people hate it, great. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And exactly. I mean, I, I have a feeling that this novel, Behind Her Eyes, might be commercially the most successful one. That's, that's, mm -hmm. I get the, I get, that is my impression. But, you know, that's not to say that she hasn't had other successful books. I mean, The Language right. of Dying, The Death yes. House, Mayhem, definitely one to check out if you haven't. This one's very, uh, very sophisticated, and you, and, and it is, uh, <laughs> You know, it's one of those books that is clearly commercial, but when you're reading it, it it's not, that has such a, I don't know, when you say a book is commercial, it almost has a negative connotation. It sounds like, you know, it's going to be too slick or something. It's not like that when you're reading it. It's just very exciting. Well, some people have a problem with a word commercial or it puts them off. When I, you know, when I'm saying this is the most commercially successful what do I mean? I mean that she's sold the most in terms right. of the reach. Right, right, right. Yeah, and and people people can be very snarky about about um, really popular books. But I, for example, I loved Gone Girl. I thought it was a lot of fun. I thought it was it was nasty, snarky, dark edged. Um, you know, went against the grain, and and yet people loved it. Um, you know, there was like the, all these discussions and all these. Every time uh, uh, Flynn, the author, appeared anywhere, she or every time she was interviewed, she was asked to sort of explain the negative aspects of the book and you know explain this horrible woman. And I just uh, yet people were eating it up. People loved it. Nobody wanted to know why she wrote a horrible woman. It was a great horrible woman. Mm. It was because crazy. everyone knows a horrible person. Everybody knows. Like yeah. Exactly. Male, female, doesn't matter. Yeah. Everyone knows someone like that. Yeah. That manipulative, mm -hmm. narcissistic, um, yeah, come up behind you and stab you in the back of the neck kind of person. <laughs> It was it was really but but more than that, you know, these two books, Behind Her Eyes and Gone Girl, you have to give these authors a lot of credit. They are beautifully constructed. These are beautifully, perfectly constructed books. So I'm not at all surprised that they're enormously popular and that they sold film rights and that, you know, these these are their most popular books. Yeah. Well, I, I think if someone says they don't like commercially successful books, that's an invalid criticism. And mm -hmm. if you truly say that and you truly think that, then that seems to be coming from a very negative place. It sounds like perhaps mm -hmm. there's some envy, there's some jealousy, there are some serious mm -hmm. issues going on because to be commercially successful just means that you sold a lot of books. If you, yeah. you can say you don't like stories that are formulaic, that have bad dialogue, that are mm -hmm. predictable, but that that have like you know archetypal characters these are fine you you can also say that in your experience a lot of books that are commercially successful don't quite fit your aesthetic that's, right that's fine too right. but if you say i don't like commercially successful books you're saying i don't like a book that sells well well that's ridiculous. Yeah. And I kind of don't. I I I I don't like to rule anything out. I, these discussions that go on online sometimes, where people debate the kind of story or the kind of writing that's better than another kind of writing, 
I, this is a very individual thing. It has to do with the individual writer and the individual story or the individual book. I can think of an example of every kind of book that I like. And yeah. so I don't ever I don't ever rule something out. I don't ever say I don't like detective novels. I don't ever say because there are a lot of them that I love. There I don't read all of them. I don't, you know, don't read everything in detective novels. I don't um there are some uh stories that are really at, that completely depend upon atmosphere and uh lush language, um beautiful imagery, um mythological and literary references and illusion illusions that um you know you have to be familiar with something someone else's work in order to really fully appreciate them and that's beautiful that's wonderful that's exciting um but it's also very exciting to pick up a book like gone girl and say wow i just can't put this down it's so exciting and fun and i wonder what the hell she's going to do next so i i don't I try not to get into those discussions where it's well, my particular kind of book that I like. <laughs> I I'm very discerning, and I only like this um, because I can think of at least a couple of examples of every kind of writing that has really appealed to me and and has made me very excited about fiction. Yeah. Well, I completely agree, and that there, there are genres that I don't necessarily gravitate towards as much. There are genres mm -hmm. that I'm not as keen on, but I would yeah. never say I don't like that type of book or I don't like that type of movie. I mean, I'm not the biggest fan of fantasy, but all that means is that... Mm -hmm. Perhaps I am a little bit more discerning or it means that like you have to have written it. It, it has to be really bloody good. But if it's really yeah. bloody good, then I'm in because ultimately in film or in books, I'm interested in story and I'm interested in character. And yeah. often the best stories, you could change the genre and it would mm -hmm. still work. Mm -hmm. my, I think my favorite book one summer when I was about 13 was The Once and Future King. And I just, in my head, I just lived that book, okay? And my sister tried and tried and tried to get me to read uh, Lord of the Rings. And I tried. I tried and I tried and could never get into it. Just no interest. Just didn't care. But The Once and Future King was really thrilling to me. And so... It's a very personal thing. Reading is so intimate. It's such an intimate experience and so personal. And yes, you know, I mean, it, there are standards for writing and there are standards for books and there are critical standards that you can apply. And you can, you can take a book apart and you can say, um, this is what it does and what it doesn't do. That's fine. But all too often, um, people will write something off critically or you know even if they don't have critical skills they will write something off as if it has no value just because it's not their preference it's not something that they personally like one of my favorite <laughs> reader reviews <laughs> i think it was on amazon it might have been goodreads i don't remember but it was um this woman had reviewed a laird baron book and she absolutely hated it. She couldn't say enough about how much she hated it. She was she was angry that she had been exposed to it. And she was, she just, she was angry at the person who had recommended it to her. <laughs> and she was <laughs> never going to take their advice again. And that's all there is to it. And she gave it five stars because despite the fact that she hated it that much, she could see that it was exceptionally well written and it was exactly what it wanted to be. <laughs> I was like, that's it. You cannot ask for more from anybody than to use their critical judgment separately from their personal preference. And that woman did that. She said, somebody else is going to love this book and it's exceptionally well written but I hate it. 
Yay, lady. That's very I loved, rare. I loved that reader. <laughs> I disagree with her. I did, I love Laird Barron's writing. But, you know, to be able to do that, to be able to step back from your own feelings about something and recognize that it's well done, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Hats off to that lady. Mm -hmm. Well, the next Patreon question is from Jake Marley, and he says, SP has written some great novels. I'd love it if you asked her about how much preparation goes into her novels, how many drafts, and how she tackles revision. Um, a lot of preparation, a lot of... Uh, I find that I'm uh, watching films reading books, um, reading short stories, and uh, for some reason, and I'm not even paying attention to it, but they all kind of have, they all kind of, you know, have something to do with one another. They're all sort of related. Maybe they have a common theme, or um, there's something about them that all kind of comes back around to something that I'm, uh, grappling with, uh, and then I'm trying to write. And then I will start making notes. Um, I'll just fill notebook after notebook. I just fill notebook after notebook with mm. just all sorts of ideas, structural ideas. Sometimes, you know, if I, if I have to describe a place that doesn't exist, I'll create maps and, um, I will bring into it everything that I can. If I need material, as I did with the Skalut cycle, and and a little bit with uh, I Wish I Was Like You, I will uh, I'll buy books that are related to that. Um, I, I had all these books of uh, street maps of Seattle in the early 90s. Um, you know, I had uh, all of these books about the city and its architecture, buildings that don't exist anymore. Um, I just will really do a lot of gathering material and, um, and some of those books I'll read cover to cover. Some of them I'll just dabble. I'll just, you know, dip in and, you know, find bits of information that help me to think about what the place looks like or where I am or the structure of my story. And, um, and then I will start working on it and I will write a complete, I will force my, my way through um, a complete draft. And uh, what I try to do is get the whole arc of the book. Um, and there will be places where I'm not really sure what happens. And I'll just leave, I'll just say, mm, Greta goes to the bridge. <laughs> right mm -hmm. and then I'll just go on to the next scene because I know what happens in the next scene and I'll write that whole scene and then it'll be something like mm, so and so has an argument with so and so and is disappointed with this blah 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 and then I'll just leave that so what I do is I try to leave placeholders and and keep going um, and then when I've got the whole arc I've got the whole story from beginning to end then I'll go back through and start filling in those placeholders. I'll fill in the scenes that are not fleshed out. And, um, and then I will revise and revise and revise. And pretty much every single time I look at the manuscript, I'll revise it. Like today, if I sat down with the manuscript of I Wish I Was Like You or the manuscript for Strange is the Night or Knock Knock right now, I would continue to revise it. I never stop. If I look at it and I read it, I will start thinking, you know, I'll start making changes. Mm -hmm. So at some point when the thing is, when the thing looks like it's, it's complete, then I need um, people to read it. And I need, I, I give it to Suzanne and I give it to my husband and I give it to a couple of other beta readers who are, uh, they're loyal and they know me, but they're merciless and they don't mind telling me this absolutely doesn't work or this section 
doesn't fit in here, or this character's not working for me, or, you know, they, they will just bluntly tell me what's not working. Um, and that saves me a lot of time and I can move forward to the next draft. And then um, I just keep doing that until it looks like it's ready for an editorial eye. Mm -hmm. And that's when I'll submit it somewhere. Or if it's already claimed, if I'm writing it for someone, then I submit it to the editor to take a look and tell me what still needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's about it. But like I said, I would never stop revising. Um, I, I, it can always be better and it can always be more layered and more complex. And so, yeah. Yeah. At some point you just have to, once the editor is satisfied and the story or the, the book is ready, you have to let it go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've noticed that Ross had asked a similar question about revision. So there you go, Ross, that answer was for you as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jake. Thank you, Ross. <laughs> So the final Patreon question is from David Powell, and he says, what is your favorite thing about the Pacific Northwest? The rain. That was I, easy. <laughs> I, love, I love rain. I've always loved rain. When I, I grew up in Decatur, Georgia, and we had thunderstorms, and I would sit on the front porch during thunderstorms, and I just, I love rain. Um, I love the way it smells when it's coming in, you know, I love the way it, you know, cleans the air and um, I, I, I just love it. And I really, we were in a seven year drought in California and all of the trees um, next to the place where we lived, uh, when we, mo when we first moved in, everything was fine and, and it was very green and you could look out the window and it was all green and gradually all of those trees died and the city and uh, the gardeners came and, you know, pulled them up and uh, took them away until it was just like nothing. There was nothing because they couldn't use the water to, to keep the trees alive because of the drought. So it just became this grim, awful place because there was not enough rain to keep the plants alive. And then... We were moving in January of this year, and in December, my husband's sister came to visit us for about 12 days over the holidays, and she wanted to go out and celebrate her birthday at Disneyland, and she wanted to go to some places, and she had come down from uh, Washington State, and she wanted some good weather, well, good weather to her meant sunshine and, you know, getting some warm, uh, you know, winter time. <laughs> we had we finally after seven years we had these massive monsoons we just just rained and ra just torrential rain every day it just rained us out of uh, her trip to Disneyland it rained every day I was just I apologized to her about a thousand times <laughs> but I think it was sort of our farewell you know as we were it was sort of california saying goodbye to us as we headed back to the northwest yeah i could do with some rain here right now it's pretty hot today i think the the weather's a bit schizophrenic like now we've got into october it can't make up its mind if it's autumn or if it's still summer Mhm. Mm mm -hmm. yeah we're still going through hurricane season here we have another Ugh. two months of it left wow yeah and it's it's funny too because it's like at right after the storm right after harvey which they don't even hurricane when it hit it was a tropical storm but mm -hmm. right after that we didn't have rain for like three weeks three and a half weeks wow. and it was actually it was a blessing because it allowed everything that you know all the water to recede and right and to dry right and then the first day it rained, it's like I had this flashback. I was going to work and I walked outside and it was I could see the you know the street, but you know right out front was like wet and it had pools of water and everything. Mm -hmm. And I had this flashback going, "It's gonna flood!" Oh you know? God! Oh God! <laughs> wow! But, you, you, know, you well, you really went through it, and your mom went through it, and that's just it was that was horrendous. 
Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. For basically forty seven inches of rain in less than eighteen hours in one location. Oh god. You know. That'll cure you like in rain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, god. And one day you'd be like, I like rain, and next to me you're like fuck rain. Fuck I'm out. Rain. <laughs> I'm out. But I, I, I do I understand exactly where it comes from, but I still love the rain. Yeah. Uh it's like old Rusty Neil says, it's, it cleanses. <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> a little Joy Ride reference there. Well, thank you so much for spending the majority of your evening chatting with us. I know, we talked for so long. Right. Oh, yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Thanks, you guys. I, I really appreciate it. I've, I've had a great time chatting with you. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, me too. It's been an it's awful fun. lot of fun. And we've we've covered <laughs> so much, but I mean, the great thing is there's still loads more that we could chat about, so that's just an excuse <laughs> to get you back on the show sometime. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, cool. I would love to. Well, where can our listeners connect with you? Um, you can find... If you Google S.P. Miskowski, you will find my WordPress uh, website. You can find me at S.P. Miskowski on Facebook and on Twitter. And if you send me a friend invitation on Facebook, if you look like a real person and not a bot or a lunatic, I will accept and we will be friends. Um, And... Yeah, and then you can look for my books on uh, Amazon, or you can look for them through the publishers, um, Omnium Gatherum, uh, publishers uh, Knock Knock and the three no- three accompanying novellas, and Journal Stone publishes I Wish I Was Like You and Strange is the Night, which is coming out October 13th. And I'm I have stories in several anthologies that are out right now um i should mention those as well uh haunted nights um edited by ellen datlow and lisa morton um that anthology just came out and that's really great there's some wonderful writers in there uh my story we're never inviting amber again is in that uh anthology i have a story in looming low which is edited by uh, Sam Cowan and Justin Steele, and oh, and the uh, the Ramsey Campbell anthology, um, Darker Companions, celebrating fifty years of Ramsey Campbell, that is out as well. Oh, and <laughs> I'm sorry, these are all coming out. These have all just come out or are just coming out. Um, one more. Uh, Tales from a Talking Board, and that's an anthology published by Word Horde, um, edited by Ross Lockhart, and he's terrific, and uh, it's another really, really interesting anthology. So I have stories in those anthologies. If people are looking for other short stories, um, if they read Strange as the Night and they like my short fiction and they're looking for more of it, they can find it in those anthologies. There you go. Great recommendations that will keep people busy for quite a while, I'm sure. <laughs> mm-hmm, and, definitely. And see their wallets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if you, if you had like a tower of money in your living room, as I'm sure is the case with a lot of our listeners, then you were thinking, well, what the hell can I spend it on? There you go. <laughs> buy them all. Just go online and buy them all tonight. Yeah. That'll there you- Great. Buy two of each, you know, one for you, one for a friend. <laughs> Gift it. If you yeah. have some left, or you can make furniture out of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you have enough, you can even have a doorstop. Yes, you can. <laughs> Which you can also do with, you know, just one China Mieville book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... What final thoughts would you like to leave our listeners with? Buy books. <laughs> I, I really do mean that. Buy, buy books and buy books from small presses. Um, you know, look around and, and, you know, there are interesting presses out there doing interesting work. Sam Cowan, 
Dim Shores. Yeah. Place. Um, Jordan Crawl, uh, Dunham's Manor Press. Uh, they they published some wonderful books, and they published my novella Muscadines, um, and Word Horde, um, and uh, Undertow, and um, there's some some wonderful small press uh, publishers out there that they they do great work, and they deserve your support. Definitely. I agree. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And that was our conversation with S.P. Miskowski. Join us again next week where we will be talking with Kathy Koja. And do stick around after the outro, after the end credits because we've got some additional content with S.P. Miskowski. So we sometimes have some outtakes at the end of the show, usually a little bit humorous, or I think they're humorous, you know, you can be the judge of that. But on this occasion, we've actually got outtakes that didn't quite fit the conversation, but I think are nonetheless useful. So Have a listen, see what you think. And before I wrap up, let's have a quick word from our sponsors. Coming October 5th, Deciduous Tales is a new literary journal featuring the very best in dark fiction. Join Richard Thomas, Matthew Brockmeyer, Douglas Milliken, Brian Asman, Josh Chaplinski, and more on a journey through the shadowy realms of literature. From horror and suspense to neo noir and transgressive, from classic creators to contemporary authors, Deciduous Tales is dedicated to highlighting the thought provoking, the scintillating, and the strange. Find out more at DeciduousTales.com or visit our Facebook page, Deciduous Tales, available October 5th. Get yours today. Edited by Daniel Kayaku with an introduction by Jonathan Mayberry, California Screaming peels back to sunshine and palm trees to expose the hidden darkness in the brutal heart of the Golden State. Forget sun-drenched beaches and shocker-given surfers. Think eldritch river monsters and haunted ghost towns. California Screaming takes readers on a hellish road trip down the 101. From wind-blown deserts to the foothills of San Gabriel Mountains, E.S. McGill, Kevin Wetmore, Chad Stroop, Sarah Reed, Kevin David Anderson, and many more spin tales of terror that will make you rethink your next vacation. California Screaming is available in paperback and ebook October 22nd. So wax up your board and get ready to scream with 14 of the West Coast's finest authors. And to wrap up, I'd like to end with a quote. And I think this is something that is applicable to a lot of creatives, especially creatives that are procrastinators, which seems to be a lot of us, unfortunately. It's difficult to get the work done. Anyway, this quote is from Debbie Millman. You don't find the time to do something. You make the time to do things. I'll see you in the next episode. Until then, take care of yourself. Be good to one another. Read horror and have a great, great day. That's why communication is so important. Mm -hmm. Communication in relationships is probably the number one thing that kills relationship or lack of communication. You know, I think that my, you know, I've seen people who they break away in relationships because they don't communicate. Mm -hmm. They don't talk. Mm -hmm. They don't, they don't share. And it's sad because you have these two people that, you know, that loved each other. And they maybe they still do, but they they've fallen away from each other. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think I think I think stressful jobs has a lot to do with that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because we don't want to be stressed, we want to be winners, and we don't want to show any 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 cracks in the veneer. You know, right. Right. everything. And just, oh, I'm number one. You know, and it's like, and you right. know, you go home. It's like you feel guilty because you didn't spend time with your kids, but you're number one in your district. Right, right. Yeah. Well, that, and that and that goes back to what I was saying about writers too. You know that that <laughs> sense that some people have. I mean, every single day, 
I see somebody I know online just completely just either they're saying, I have to get offline for a while, I'm so depressed, or I can't take this anymore, I'm thinking about quitting writing, or, you know, there's in despair because they think that there's a certain way that things are supposed to happen um, and they don't feel successful. And, you know, especially, especially in the U.S., um, it, there's so much pressure to be successful and to be able to show the outward signs of success. Um, that if, if you can't do that, you're always justifying yourself, you know, and writers are always having to explain why they're doing what they're doing. Um, instead of, you know, just enjoying it and delving and everything. Um, even if you work 40 hours a week, like I did for years and years and years, and I would get up early in the morning to write, and I would write on the weekend. And so all of my time was taken up. Um, and still, I felt that I had to explain or justify writing. You know, even when I had a job that paid well, and I had a, you know, job title that made people go, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, that I'd tell them about my writing and, you know, oh, well, what have you, you know, what, can I buy one of your books or yeah. yes? Yeah, sure. Walk right into Barnes and Noble and tell them. You want my book. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if, if you weren't really, really commercially successful at something, it's as if it didn't matter at all. Um, and I, I think it's hard to create that space for yourself where you're allowed to do this thing that you love without having to justify it all the time. Right. As creatives, we have enough self-doubt on our own. We don't need other people contributing to it. It's true. It's true. And, you know, you need a pat on the back from time to time. And and um, I've been very lucky because the, the small press publishers I've worked with, and now, now I'm working with Journal Stone um, on these last two books, um, I wish I was like you and the collection strange is the night and you know journalstone they've they've done a great job at getting the books out um getting them reviewed they got them out to publishers weekly and they were well reviewed and um they talk the books up and they and they don't just do that they contact me and they give me a little you know word of encouragement um and that goes a long way, uh, that feeling of not, you know, just hanging on by your fingertips mm. and, and having to explain to people why you're spending so much time working on this book. Um, having somebody just give you a little pat on the back once in a while, it, it's very important. It goes a long way. And um, so I, I like working with them. I, I've signed on to do another novel. I'm writing another novel and a novella for them for the, and those will be out next year. Um, but, you know, just having your editor say, this is really great. Um, or wow, look at this review, <laughs> right? <laughs> you just, you know, it makes your day because there are so many hard slogs. <laughs> so many times when you're just, you're working and you're working and you're saying, oh, I, don't, I don't know if this is going to come together. I'm having a great time, but I'm not sure this book is going to be any good. <laughs> and to just have your editor send you an email and be ex as excited about a positive review or about you know something a, a book blurb from a writer that you admire as excited about it as you are. It's um there there's just kind of no substitute for that mm. <laughs> of course your friends love you your spouse loves you um you know people will give you a pat on the back because they love you and they care about you but it, to have someone who is in the this field in this profession um just kind of say this is exceptional i'm i'm really loving working with you i'm enjoying working with you and look at this thing that happened for us and you know it's very helpful i 
a few minutes ago, like, I think you tried to call, and I tried to answer, mm-hmm. but tried is the operative word there. <laughs> I just, <laughs> just like, hello, okay, I'm not part of a call, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I thought that the uh, second half would be yeah, less exciting if I just thought, well, fuck it, I'll work with what I've got and just try to interview myself. <laughs> that might have been, <laughs> been lesser. And also, some would argue a little bit misleading if I'm billing it as an interview with S.P. Muskowski. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs>